story time with Ranger Sarah. Hey boys and girls, it's Ranger Sarah from Whitewater State Park. And today, I wanted to think about turtles. Yeah, turtles. I mean, they're pretty cool, right? Actually, I think turtles are amazing. And so I want you to be thinking about our turtle friends, where they live, what kind of habitat do turtles have, what are some of the problems turtles are facing, and how can we help our turtle friends? And so I want to start out with this story, which is a legend. And so legends are myths, folk tales, ancient stories that teach about the origins of things, how things got their names, um, things like that. And so they're usually pretty old stories that have been handed down from generation to generation. And the story I want to share with you today is an Ojibwe legend. The Ojibwe people in Minnesota live in northern Minnesota, for the most part. Um, so when you go up north, where you see all the pine trees and lots of lakes, that's the land of the Ojibwe people here in Minnesota. And um, the legend we're going to share today comes from this book called the Mishomis Book, The Voice of the Ojibwe. And this is written by an Ojibwe man from Minnesota. And this book is full of legends, but we're going to focus on the legend of the Great Flood. Because in this story, Turtle is sort of an unlikely hero. And what's interesting with this Great Flood is all around the world, different cultures talk and teach about a Great Flood that happened long ago where the Earth was underwater. So with the Great Flood story, you know, what's really interesting is cultures all around the world have this story about a Great Flood. It's a very common legend in lots of different cultures. On the story of how the earth was flooded and everything, all the land was underwater, many, many animals perished. And so this story about the Great Flood from the Ojibwe uh, people is a story of how the earth was reborn again. And Turtle is an important character in this story. Also in this story, you're gonna hear the name Wainabuju. And Wainabuju is the first man. The creator, the great spirit, put the first man on earth to go around and give everything a name. And so the Ojibwe legends often are told through the eyes of Wainabuju as he's exploring the earth and he's learning about all the creatures and the plants and he's naming them. And we hear about how they got their names. And so in this story, we're gonna hear Wainabuju and lots of different animals trying to figure out how to help the earth after the great flood. So let's start with this great flood story. The Mishomis Book, The Voice of the Ojibwe by Edward Benton Benai. After the great flood, Wainabuju managed to save himself by resting on a huge log that was floating on the vast expanse of water that covered Mother Earth. As he floated along on this log, some of the animals that were able to keep swimming came to rest on the log. They would rest for a while and then let another swimming animal take a place. It was the same way with the winged creatures. They would take turns resting on the log and flying. It was through this kind of sacrifice and concern for one another that Wainabuju and large group of birds and four-leggeds were able to save themselves on the giant log. They floated for a long time but could gain no sight of land. Finally, Wainabuju spoke to the animals. I am going to do something, he said. I am going to swim to the bottom of this water and grab a handful of earth. With this small bit of earth, I believe we can create a new land for us to live on with the help of the four winds and Gichi Manitu. So Wainabuju dived into the water. He was gone for a long time. Some of the animals began to cry for they thought that Wainabuju must have drowned trying to reach the bottom. At last, the animals caught sight of some bubbles of air and finally Wainabuju came to the top of the water. Some of the animals helped him onto the log. Wainabuju was so out of breath he could not speak at first. When he regain, regained his strength, he spoke to the animals. The water is too deep. I never reach the bottom. I cannot swim fast enough or hold my breath long enough to make it to the bottom. All of the animals on the log were silent for a long time. The loon, who was swimming alongside the log, was the first to speak. I can dive under the water for a long ways, for that is how I catch my food. I will try to dive to the bottom and get some earth in my beak. The loon dived out of sight and was gone a long time. The animals felt sure he had drowned, but the loon floated to the top of the water. He was very weak and out of breath. I couldn't make it, he gasped. There appears to be no bottom to this water. Next, the hell diver came forth. 
I will try to swim to the bottom, he said. I am known for diving to great depths. The hell diver was gone for a very long time. When the animals and Wena Buju were about to give up hope, they saw the hell diver's body come floating to the top. He was unconscious, and Wena Buju had to pull him onto the log and help him regain his breath. When the hell diver came to, he spoke to all the animals on the log. I am sorry, my brothers and sisters. I too could not reach the bottom, although I swam for a long ways straight down. Many of the animals offered themselves to do the task that was so important to the future of all life on earth. The mink tried but could not make it to the bottom. The otter tried and failed. Even the turtle tried but was unsuccessful. All seemed hopeless. It appeared that the water was so deep that no living thing could reach its bottom. Then a soft, muffled voice was heard. I'll try, it said softly. At first, no one could see who it was that spoke. The little muskrat stepped forth. I'll try, he said again. Some of the animals laughed and poked each other. The hell diver jeered, If I couldn't make it, how can he expect to do any better? Wenabuju spoke. Hold it, everyone. It is not our place to judge the merits of another. The task belongs to the creator. If little muskrat wants to try, I feel we should let him. The muskrat dived down and disappeared from view. He was gone for such a long time that Wenabuju and all the animals on the log were certain that muskrat had given up his life in trying to reach the bottom. The muskrat was able to make it to the bottom of the water. He was already very weak from lack of air. He grabbed some earth in his paw, and with every last bit of strength he could muster, muskrat pushed away from the bottom. One of the animals on the log caught sight of Muskrat as he floated to the water's surface. They pulled his body onto the log. Uwena Buju examined the Muskrat. Brothers and sisters, Uwena Buju said, our little brother tried to go without air for too long. He is dead. A song of mourning and praise was heard over the water as Muskrat's spirit passed to the next world. Uwena Buju spoke again. Look, Muskrat has something in his paw. It is closed tight around something. Wenabuju carefully pried open Muskrat's tiny paw. All the animals gathered around trying to see. Muskrat's paw opened, and there, in a little ball, was a piece of earth. All the animals cheered. Muskrat had sacrificed his life so that life could begin anew on the earth. Wenabuju took the piece of earth from the Muskrat's paw. At that moment, Turtle swam forward and said, Use my back to bear the weight of this piece of earth. With the help of the creator, we can make a new earth. Wenabuju put the piece of earth on Turtle's back. All of a sudden, the winds began to blow. The wind blew from each of the four directions. The tiny piece of earth on the turtle's back began to grow. Larger and larger it became until it formed an island in the water. Still the earth grew, but still the turtle bore its weight on his back. Wenabuju began to sing a song. All the animals began to dance in a circle on the growing island. As he sang, they danced in an ever-widening circle. Finally, the winds ceased to blow, and the waters became still. A huge island sat in the middle of the great water. Today, traditional Indian people sing special songs and dance in a circle in memory of this event. Indian people also give special honor to our brother, the turtle. He bore the weight of the new earth on his back and made life possible for the earth's second people. To this day, the ancestors of our brother, the muskrat, have been given a good life. No matter that marshes have been drained and their homes destroyed in the name of progress, the muskrats continue to multiply and grow. The creator has made it so that muskrats will always be with us because of the sacrifice that our little brother made for all of us many years ago when the earth was covered with water. The muskrats do their part today in remembering the great flood. They built their homes in the shape of the little ball of earth and the island that was formed from it. I really like that story. It's a beautiful story. It kind of gives me goosebumps. Um, and it, it, it really forces me to think about turtles in a different way. The turtle is a very sacred animal, um, not just to the Ojibwe people, but cultures around the world. Um, there's lots of different indigenous peoples, not just in North America, but in other countries that um, see turtles as sacred beings. And so um, this whole idea of Turtle Island and that the shape of North America, if you're creative when you look at it, it kind of is shaped like a turtle, is really a special thing to think about. So what I'd like to do now is kind of show you a couple things you can do to help our turtle friends. If you've been thinking about, you know, turtles and what's, what's happening to 
the land around where our turtles live, the waters where our turtle lives, turtles live, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues. And so it, we really do need all of us, you and me, all of us working together to help our turtles. And so thinking about how we can reduce pollution and litter that ends up in the waters, how we can protect habitat, like these sandy areas near the water where turtles like to come and lay their eggs, um, and how we can help turtles along our busy roads because turtles cross roads often to go lay eggs. So what I'd like to show you today are two ways you can help turtles. One is how you can safely help turtles cross the road with a grown-up to help you. And the other one is how you can create a turtle cage to protect a turtle nest if you happen to live in a neighborhood where turtles come into your yard to lay eggs. Um, turtle nests get eaten. The eggs get eaten by all sorts of different predators. Skunks and raccoons and crows and all kinds of different animals love to eat turtle eggs. Actually, most turtle eggs get eaten before they hatch. So by putting a little cage around the turtle nest, we can protect those eggs until the, the babies hatch and are ready to crawl to the water. So I'm going to show you two ways today that you can help turtles. Come and check it out. Let's take it outside. Okay, so I have here a shell of a painted turtle. When this turtle was alive, the bottom would have been a little bit oranger, more bright orange. But this is an empty turtle shell, and we're going to use this just to demonstrate how to help a turtle across the road if you happen to come across one. So we're going to set this guy down here, pretend he's crossing the road, and maybe I'm out for a walk in my neighborhood and I see this turtle crossing the road. So first thing I want to do is I want to look around. If there are no cars coming, I'm going to stay back and I'm going to let this turtle cross by himself. Because I timed it and it takes a turtle about 10 seconds to get across the road. They can cruise pretty fast. And so the best thing to do is leave him alone, her alone, and let them get across on their own. Because when you pick up a turtle, oftentimes that turtle is going to expel water. It's going to kind of squirt some water out. And that's water that they need for making their nest and laying their eggs. And so if that turtle releases her water, you know what she's going to have to do? She's going to have to turn around and go all the way back to the swamp to get more water and she's gonna have to cross that road again. So we actually just made things harder for her. So it's best to leave her alone if we can and let her cross the road all by herself. Now, if that's not an option, like say a car is coming and we really got to help her get across, first thing you wanna make sure it's safe for you and for the people. So I always make sure the cars are stopped and usually I have somebody with me so they can kind of stop the cars. And then I'm gonna go up to this turtle grasp it in the middle of the shell where the bottom and the top shell come together. I'm going to grasp it firmly so it can't wiggle loose and drop. I'm only going to lift it a couple inches. I'm going to keep it really close to the ground. Take it straight across the road in the direction its head was facing because that turtle was trying to get somewhere. It wants to go that direction. I'm going to, I'm going to help it get to that direction. So I want to move that turtle straight across yourself in danger um, and if it was a snapping turtle snapping turtles are a little bit different we actually don't want to touch snapping turtles with our hands because they have very flexible necks and the bigger snapping turtles have a very strong beak and they could actually take a finger off so I'm going to show you some tools you can use to move a, tur a snapping turtle if you ever had to do that so I have here a little snapping turtle it's not alive this is a one that died, I'm not sure how it died, and we preserved it so it looks like it's still alive, but it's not a live turtle, and I can use this for teaching. And so the snapping turtle looks very different than the other turtles we have in Minnesota. Um, it has these ridges on its back that really stick up almost like a dinosaur, and also along the tail. And when you see a snapping turtle, you can tell they're very different than the other turtles around. Um, so I wouldn't want to pick this guy up, even a little one can bite and they're not afraid to bite. That's probably one of their first uh, defense mechanisms is to try to bite. And like I said, they have a very flexible neck. So instead of picking up a snapping turtle, what I would do is find a stick, a good sized stick along the side of the road, and you can put that stick down in front of their face and usually they're gonna bite it. And oftentimes they lock on when they bite it. So you can actually gently drag them off to the side of the road. 
So that's one thing you can do. I like to carry a snow shovel in my vehicle all summer long, all year long. Um, and so if there's snapping turtles that won't get out of the road, I can actually gently scoop under them with the snow shovel and move them off to the side using a snow shovel. So keep that in mind. We still want to help our snapping turtles. They're still good, good friends. They're important in the natural world, but we just want to be careful so we don't end up getting bit. Um, you don't want to pick them up by the tail because that can hurt them. And some of the bigger snapping turtles are pretty heavy. If you were to pick them up by the tail, that can actually hurt their back. It can break their back. So we don't want to hurt the animal. We're trying to help it. So um, use a stick or use a shovel to gently slide them off to the side of the road. 